to Dennis Bergen, whose idea it was to celebrate the centenary uh, of the first sitting of the Dáil with an exhibition on Leinster House, and who put in all of the hard work in organising today's uh, symposium. We're going to start then uh, with Nicola Kelly. Uh, Nicola is uh, archivist at the OPW Minute University Archive and Research Centre located in Castletown in Kildare. She's a graduate of Minute uh, University and she holds a master's degree in archival studies from there. In the archive, we've been uh, tic-tacking with Nicola for over two years now since I think about three weeks before the start of COVID, we had the first meeting on a project to digitize and make accessible online the letters of Lady Louisa Connolly. Uh, we will get there, I think, eventually, but uh, that's for a later date. This morning, Nicola will get things going by telling us uh, not just about Louisa, but about indeed all of the Lennox sisters uh, and their approaches to decoration and design. Nicola. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Connolly Estate Archive. Uh, particularly the letters of Lady Louisa Connolly, um, which are cared for by the OPW Maynooth University Archive and Research Centre at Castletown House. These letters have formed the, in, the decorative influences in the country houses of the Lennox sisters. Highlighted mainly in correspondence between sisters Emily, Duchess of Leinster, and Lady Louisa Connolly. The letters uncovered the remarkable influence of the Duke and Duchess of Leinster as two of the most fashionable peers of the 18th century. Using Leinster House and Carton House to shape the design of neighbouring Castletown House, this paper will also discuss the modern use of the letters to inform the continued research and preservation of Castletown House. The letters of Lady Louisa Connolly date from 1759 to 1821. Lady Louisa and her younger siblings were still children when their parents, the Duke and Duchess of Richmond, died within a year of each other in 1750 and 1751. When the young, youngest Lennox sisters arrived at Carton House, Emily, Duchess of Leinster, was 20 years of age and had been married for four years, and she also had children of her own. Carton would become Louisa's home for the next seven years, and in addition to spending much time at Leinster House. At this time, Carton was still being remodeled. While growing up, Louisa would see architects, designers, painters, and papers, plasters, stone cutters, and making masons working throughout the house. The domain at Carton was also being developed. The river was widened, roads and paths were cut, gardens were laid out, and shrubs, trees, and flowers were planted. The work was supervised by the Duke and Duchess of Leinster. When the Duke was away, Lady Louise would often accompany her sister Emily. This upbringing at Carton paved the way for Louise's decorative inspiration for her own home. Lady Louisa Lennox and Thomas Connolly were married at the end of 1758. For a while, there was some speculation as to whether they would settle at Castletown House or indeed in Ireland. Then her sister Emily was especially concerned and wrote to her husband. James Fitzgerald. Dearest Jemmy, I am afraid by all that I hear that Connolly does not intend being here next winter for any time. Now nobody has more power with him than you, and I wish you'd represent both to Louisa and him how necessary it is for them to settle their affairs here, and how much better that would be done by bringing their family and coming for some time than just to hurry over for a couple of months. I am quite miserable about it, do pique his pride by telling him what consequence he may be of here. The Duke and Duchess of Leinster's influence is documented throughout Louisa and Emily's correspondence. Louisa immediately set about organising her household very shortly after her marriage. In a letter to her sister Emily, the Duchess of Leinster, on the 4th of October 1759, she writes, Your advice as to looking and knowing what is done in the house has already made me think a great deal about it. Castletown House was a huge shell of a building. Little had been done with its interior since, since Speaker Connolly's death in 1729. Lady Louisa and Tom had originally considered demolishing the house at Castletown and starting afresh. By the 1760s, the design and layout of the house was considered far too old fashioned. The Duke of Leinster, however, persuaded them not to demolish and wrote to his wife, Emily, I told Lady Louisa that when she came to live here after the alterations were made, 
that she would be obliged to me for finding out that the alterations could be made without pulling down the house. The re-altering of Castletown House between 1759 and 1776 was not only desirable to a youthful couple like Tom and Louisa, but also required. Like society in England, they were obliged to hold assemblies and balls for which it was necessary for great numbers of people to move about in decorative and light-hearted interconnecting rooms. While Lady Louisa was in the planning stages at Castletown, she also consulted her older brother, the third Duke of Richmond. At the time, the Duke was remodeling his own home at Goodwood House in Sussex, England, and his architect was William Chambers. Chambers also designed the stable block there and later the, rede the redecoration of the first floor apartments in Leinster House. Earlier in May 1759, Lady Louisa wrote, Mr. Connolly says, there, says they were to send the rest of the plans afterwards, or else Mr. Chambers, the architect, had explained it to others. From 1759, the work of redecorating the house was ongoing. Although Lady Louisa was in England for much of 1759, the Duke and Duchess of Leinster supervised the work at Castletown in her absence. I am vastly happy to find you go to Castletown. In one of your letters, you mentioned that Mr. Connolly had forgot to send over some of the finishings for the great room. And a letter written in 1761 indicates that having made some changes to the house, was the house was complete. By 1762, the alterations were again underway and the Duke of Leinster wrote to his wife, I am glad you are so well entertained at Castletown, where you say you have variety of, a variety of men going backwards and forwards. I only fear that when I return, you will find Carton stupid and dull. Lady Louisa's correspondence also recorded that her bedroom apartment was refitted in 1763. The Lafranchini brothers, uh, Swiss-Italian stuccadores, who created the stucco work in the Gold Salon and the dining room at Carton House in 1739, were later commissioned to create the stucco work in the entrance hall of Castletown here. Lady Louisa and Tom had been influenced by the Duke and Duchess of Leinster to hire expert craftsmen like Lafrancini. However, Lady Louisa was certainly not shy at expressing in her letters her consternation for the brothers. In a letter to her sister Emily, Duchess of Leinster, in May 1759, she writes, Mr. Connolly and I are excessively diverted at Francini's impertinence, and if he charges anything of that sort to Mr. Connolly, there is a fine scold in store for his honour. The dining room was established by Lady Louisa Connolly in the early 1760s, and previously this space was an apartment of rooms, whose use stated to the speaker William Connolly's time, and it was used by either him or his wife Catherine. It had consisted of two larger rooms, one of which was for dining and the other for sleeping, and two closet rooms. This can be seen in the earlier plan of the house. The dining room had been established in this part of the house on the suggestion of the Duke of Leinster. The ceiling in this room, derived from Inigo Jones's banqueting hall at Whitehall, is based on the ceiling in, Len in the Leinster House dining room, designed by Isaac Ware. The dining room, while in use in 1767, was not completely finished until the following year, for in 1768, the Duchess of Leinster had suggested craftsmen like Richard Cransfield, among others, to complete other works. Louisa later mentions Cranfield's work in, her, uh, in a letter to her sister, Lady Sarah Lennox. My dearest Sally, there are also gilders in the house, just come to gild the frames of our pictures in the dining room. All this finishing work is very entertaining. I am busy as a bee and that you know is mighty pleasant. The dining room would appear it was finished by 1767 when Lady Louisa wrote, the Duke of Leinster and my sister dined here the other day. It was the first time that he had dined here since our new dining room was made, which he had the making of. I may, I may say, for, hi, for it was him that persuaded Mr. Connolly to do it. He liked it vastly. Her younger sister, Lady Sarah, also approved. Sarah likes, the di likes dining better in our great dining room, which she likes excessively. In another letter from Lady Louisa to her sister, the Duchess of Leinster, that she had 
being at Castletown every morning where everything is going on so well that we shall, we shall get into it in May. However, she was still in Leakslip Castle in early May when she wrote that she hoped in a few days we hope to get to Castletown. You have no notion how pretty it looks now. I am quite like a child about getting there. I am so impatient. It is no surprise that another residence was required for the account books of the 1760s are full of references to the work taking place, including the names of many craftsmen, Mr. Ford, the plasterer, Mr. Cransfield, a carver and gilder, Walker, the cabinet maker, William Heston, the mason, Mr. Camcross, the painter, Mr. Bowers, a cabinet maker. In 1768, Louisa was also helping to decorate her sister Emily's dressing room at Leinster House. In a letter written from Frascati of Black Rock, her sister's seaside villa, she tells Sarah, you know how much I love a new piece of work. I have begun embroidering some chairs for my sister's white damask dressing room in town. Cecilia is doing some also. She will, I fancy, do most of them, but I'm very fo fond of the work at present. The energetic and talented Lady Louisa Connolly was never going to be content to confine her activities to attending balls and participating in the latest gossip. Like her older acquaintance, acquaintance Mrs. Delaney, she demonstrates a talent for workmanship and design that makes us wonder what she might have achieved under other circumstances and perhaps in a different era. The Long Gallery um, at Castleton is probably one of Lady Louisa's most ambitious projects. Originally laid out as a picture gallery with portraits of William Connolly's patrons on display, its function and layout changed under Lady Louisa. In 1760, she had the original doorways to the upper east and west corridors removed, <coughs> replacing them with the central doorway above the entrance hall. The new door cases, as well as new fireplaces at either end, were designed by leading English architect Sir William Chambers while the actual execution was overseen by Simon Virpil. The Pompeian style decoration on the walls date from the 1770s and were inspired by the ex excavations of Pompeii. The murals were the work of an English artist and engraver, Charles Reuben Riley, and the work on the gallery was already underway by 1759. And Louisa again sought advice from the Duke of Leinster on its design, writing, we have sent by Lord Kildare the designs for finishing the gallery. And by, Decem by December the following year, she wrote, the gallery will be done in a fortnight. Throughout their, their correspondence, it is evidently clear that Emily, the Duchess of Leinster, advised Louisa on portraits, what was fashionable, how to sit for your portrait, and ranking artists' abilities. In 1764, Louisa writes, My sister Kildare has set me, set me quite distracted about a picture of you that she says is quite beautiful, done by Reynolds. I am sure I would dote upon it. It sounds the prettiest thing in nature, and when I see it, if it answers my expectation, I will go to jail rather than not have it. But I'll persuade Mr. Connolly to buy it for his gallery. I mean a copy, for I hear Mr. Bunbury intends to have this. In short, I am wild about pictures of you and my sister Kildare. I don't think I shall ever be satisfied without dozens of them. The Long Gallery also became a space for informal entertaining, full of life and activity, as the following letter from Lady Louisa to Emily, Duchess of Leinster, would suggest. Our gallery was in great vogue and really is a charming room, for there is such a variety of occupations in it that people cannot be formal in it. Lord Harcourt has, was writing, some of us played at whist, others at billiards, Mrs. Gardner on the harpsichord, others at chess, others reading and supper at one end. I have seldom seen 20 people in a room so easily disposed of. Additionally, in correspondence to her sisters, Emily and Sarah, Lady Louisa also documents the design of the gardens and landscape at Castletown, frequently thanking Emily for her advice. I must describe to you now my delightful, pleasant situation. I am sitting in an alcove in my garden, a lovely fine day, the grass looking very green, honeysuckles and roses in abundance. The birds are singing, the fresh air is all about. 
I am at this minute as happy and as pleasant as I can be. In that letter, Louisa describes a pleasure garden which she had commissioned at Castletown, a feature that the Office of Public Works has carefully restored. Taking into consideration the context of the archive in its geographic location, Lady Louisa's letters and the estate records have played a pivotal role in informing the continued preservation of the landscape and gardens once, once beloved by Tom and Louisa. They also document the influence of the Duke and Duchess of Leinster discussing fashionable country gardens. And previously, the Archive and Research Centre collaborated with the OPW to research and use excer excerpts from Lady Louisa's letters to inform the continued preservation of the gardens at Castletown. These excerpts had already been noted during the catalog cataloguing of the archive in 2012, but we also utilised the estate accounts in the Irish Architectural Archive, which records specific variations from the garden, <coughs> which Lady Louisa described in a letter, has been in the greatest perfection this year, for my flowers are now coming up in the natural ground. My dear sister Leinster, I received the flowers from your gardener at Carton, it has so delighted me. You must see the progress made here at my, at my pretty dear Castletown. We see examples from the estate accounts of works carried out at the Pleasure Garden and the estate records from June 1773 show an order for velvet roses to be planted, paid for Lady Louisa Connolly. The Castletown estate accounts, some of which are at the Archive and Research Centre at Castletown and the Irish Architectural Archive, were consulted and established timelines of work carried out. For example, in May 1764, the accounts tell us 10 velvet roses were ordered for Lady Louisa Connolly. The estate account books also note labourers' names that were recorded and other important details, such as their duties carried out in the gardens, wages paid, and number of days worked. In a letter to her sister Emily Fitzgerald, Duchess of Leinster, Lady Louisa describes and confirms this timeline of works being carried out on the estate. In a letter dated 25th of March, 1777, she writes, my chief business has been the kitchen garden. We are, so rare, we are also rearing the grape house at Leakslip Castle. I am grown so wise about fruit trees that I think we must have good fruit now. Although traditionally, um, as, as archivists and curators, we have been uh, expressly concerned with the information found in collections and the uh, focus has fallen on more heavily on explicit knowledge. Clearly, these letters are much more than information and more than materials. They are documentary residue, physical man manifestations of the writer's thoughts and activity. In that sense, physical archives are objects of material culture and subject to the same reactions, internal and external, as traditional objects of material culture. The letters of Lady Louisa Connolly and the Lennox sisters in their original form are physical representations of knowledge and are endowed with many layers of physical elements from the paper, the ink, handwriting, etc. And also the act of physically researching these letters has resulted in a unique element of this particular archive. The physical nature of the material, only available with the original documents and the experience of doing archival research, knowing that you are within walking distance of Lady Louisa's mid 18th century writing bureau, patterns are, patterns are formed during this act. And the interaction of the user with the actual physical materials and environment in which archives are housed resulted in an exciting new discovery at Castletown. Whilst cataloguing the letters, the original purpose of a room located on the first floor was uncovered. The Connollys had commissioned a coffee room between 1762 and 1763 to entertain small parties with imported luxuries, which are recorded in the estate accounts, <coughs> such as Dutch cacao and champ champagne. Lady Louisa mentions the coffee room in a letter to her sister, Lady Sarah Lennox, dating 19th of January, 1766. She, Lady Powerscourt, has an aversion to a coffee room and thinks it's so wicked a thing that our having one here, it shocks her prodigiously. And with the other circumstance of my not having children, she does not like me at all. Unfortunately, the information describing the room is fragmented. 
It, it, it is listed in Arthur Young's Castle Town House, the seat of the Right Honourable Thomas Connolly, uh, produced in 1780. Additionally, we know of its existence through the correspondence of estate accounts, which mention a new key for the coffee room and drawers in 1763, and £10 of, our, £10 of iron for the coffee room grate, and a new key for the brass lock of the coffee room. This discovery offers insights into not only the growth and popularity of the coffee trade in Ireland, and although men were occasionally men occasionally frequented coffee houses, it is unusual that one features in an estate like Castletown, especially commissioned by the Connollys, as conversation in coffee houses typically revolved around business and politics, with the majority of coffee, coffee houses prohibiting women. We can only imagine the scrutiny and further. <coughs> In with, with which Lady Louisa incurred. It is evident from the Lennox sisters' correspondence, in particular those which document the influence of the Duke and Duchess of Leinster, as two of Ireland's most fashionable peers of the 18th century. Their legacy exists today not only in Leinster House and Carton House, but also in the homes of their extended families, as evidenced here in the archives. The letters uncovered their remarkable influence using Leinster House and Carton to shape the design of neighbouring Castletown House and utilising some of the world's most renowned architects, designers and craftsmen to pave the way for some of Ireland's most beautiful country homes. Additionally, the intrinsic value of these letters and their continued use marks archival repositories like Omark, situated in historic historic structures of Castletown House are not static, they involve both the past and the future and are always historically situated. By taking into account a person's experience with archival materials, we add another layer to what it may be like for a user to use archives. Each person brings their own arsenal of background, knowledge and mood, and each collection brings with it its own unique organisation and history and each archival repository imbues a certain sense of environment to the transaction of searching within its confines. The original sources in the Connolly archive can main, remain close to the activities that have produced them, and these activities can provide an interpretive context for that information, as demonst demonstrated today. Each new user of archival collections bring, brings their own varied experiences and knowledge with them to each encounter. It is possible then that each individual, seeing the contextual representation of a set of archival material, may see a different pattern or new information that no one else has seen before. Archives are the raw materials of research. They foster discovery, give voice to previous perspe perspectives, and support our ability to learn from the past. Archival material is especially rich with potential for provi providing meaning, since the process of discovery is always possible. Their care is a hefty responsibility, not only because it may contain evidence of past behaviours or thoughts, but because it could contain the potential connection that makes it more than just a piece of paper or more than just files. In that sense, archives can be seen as sources of meaningful experience and in their rightful place as expressions of human communication and behaviour. Thank you very much.